Okay, good afternoon. We have now familiarized ourselves with flat space time. We have got to know new coordinates, the Rindle coordinates. And I will now move on to a more interesting metric, one that you have already to some extent seen in the exercises, namely the um, Schwarzschild metric. Before I define the metric, I mean, you have seen the definition probably in the exercises, but before I define it again in the lectures, let me remind you of a few things that are going to be important for the treatment. So first of all, I mentioned several times that in special relativity, we are dealing, of course, with flat space time, but we are making also another assumption. And the other assumption is that the coordinates in which we describe the physics is usually the coordinate system that belongs to in, in inertial frame. And the chart transformation maps that correspond to changing from coordinates of one inertial frame to the coordinates of another inertial frame are therefore linear transformations. That's essentially what an inertial frame is. It's actually defined physically as a frame or as a um, reference that moves with constant velocity. But if you translate that into a coordinate transformation, it co responds to a linear coordinate transformation. And we have seen that these are the Lorentz transformations. So they are very special transformations. And in GR, even if we consider flat space time, we are usually interested in more general coordinates. So we are interested, in other words, in reference frames that are not necessarily inertial. And the Rindler coordinates are a particular choice of curvilinear coordinates. They are not an inertial frame. They are natural coordinates for an observer who is accelerated. And I physically motivated this by the fact that we are now, as we are standing here, accelerated by the Earth's gravitational field. So of course, now I kind of mix terms. So we should say there is, of course, just space time and this, it is curved. But the thing that prevents us from doing, from having a straight world line is the ground or the chair on which we sit, which pushes against us and accelerates us. So if we would look at our um, existence, our world line in a diagram, and let's do that actually. So we. A diagram in which we have, let's say here, the typical x coordinate and the t. So um, that's this. And let's now assume that we are in flat, flat space time. That's, of course, not the case because we are in the Earth's gravitational field. But let's suppose we are in a space time where we have the same acceleration, but which can be approximated as being flat otherwise. Then the world line that corresponds to um, us essentially looks like this. So it's accelerated and in the, in this case, x direction. What we have learned from Rindler coordinates is that this acceleration, even if it's constant, manages essentially to escape a light ray that in this, in these particular coordinates would be originating here from the origin. So that's a 45 degree line. And the orange line that's now not drawn very nicely, so let me redraw it, would correspond to a curve that somehow asymptotically approximates this green line, but never reaches it. It's a hyperbola. It also extends to the past. and of course, also this green light ray can be kind of sought um, as a, right, like a, um, a light ray that is somehow sent out from infinity and reaches the origin, if I go here into the back direction. But let's here focus on this direction. And in this case, we can also kind of complete this diagram by just putting additional coordinate lines. So, the green line, the orange line, just corresponds to a world line of a possible observer. But we could say there could be other observers, which are also accelerated. And they would correspond to different distances from the origin of this coordinate system. 
for example, r equal one for our original observer and r equal two for another one and so on. And then we have said that the natural choice of coordinates in the other direction, the space-like direction, would be coordinates such that the lines of constant coordinate value, which we called, by the way, omega, are linear. I mean, they are straight lines in this in these coordinates, but they kind of asymptotically approach this forty-five degree line. So the 45 degree line um, would be the one corresponding to a very high value in the limit of an infinitely high value of omega. So that's now a coordinate system. And now I just said these are natural. Let me discuss this a bit, what these mean. So what are these green lines? Why is this a natural choice of coordinates? So it's clear that the orange lines they're immediately natural by the scenario I described. I said, these are just the world lines of observers that have a distance, different distance here from the origin. So in what sense are, are these green lines also natural? Before I give you an answer to that, let us just remind ourselves of the metric, um, of the Minkowski metric. So the Minkowski metric is the metric in flat space time that would correspond to the coordinates x and t. How does this metric look like in the r omega coordinates? Or omega r, I should say, because the omega is more a time type coordinate, whereas the r is more a space type coordinate. And I usually mention the time type coordinate first. So the metric, that's also repetition, is given by g equal to r square, then the omega tends to the omega minus the r tends to the r. So there's no prefactor here. And then remember there were further entries which correspond to the other dimensions. I think I already last time put them in gray because I want for the following, just for simplicity, focus on one spatial dimension. And this is the one dimension in which we accelerate. So as I said, think of this as the world line of us sitting here, which looks in this diagram curved, although we think we are at rest. But we are, of course, accelerated. You, if you think about it, you also feel it. And that's exactly this acceleration that is visible in this diagram. And which we have seen to somehow depend on R. So there was another property we have seen last time and which is also obvious from this metric that I just wrote down. Namely the following, if you look at the distance between, for example, this point and this point, then this distance is one. How do you see that? You go into the metric and you see that there is no prefactor in front of the ER, ER component which means that dr is really directly, I mean, is one-to-one -one related to the spatial distance. But the same is now true for whatever value of w you choose. So if I, for example, take the distance between this event and this event, it's again one. More precisely, it's actually minus one, because of course the metric measures spatial distances as negative distances according to our convention. And this remains the same. So if we consider these, has the relevant distances between the observers, then we could say that the observers stay at the same distance as they accelerate. So now the question, of course, you could ask is why should I measure the distance like this? Why is it the distance between this event and this? And why don't I, for example, measure the distance here between an event here and here? So that would just be another choice. And that I will justify um, in the following way. I will say, that the thing that makes these green lines natural coordinates is that these are the lines which correspond to a notion of simultaneity of the observers. So if you are an observer and you are here at that event, you're passing here, you could ask what is the set of all events that you consider happening at the same time? And I explained actually quite at length that 
things happening at the same time is an observer-dependent notion. So there may be different definitions. And I also mentioned that in curved space-time, it may even be ambiguous what that means. But remember, here we are in flat space-time. So the observer passing here could ha should have a notion of what happens at the same time. And this set of things happening at the same time turns out to be this green line. There are several ways to see why this is the case. And um, one maybe nice way, which differs a bit from the way I explained it last time, is to just look at this graphically. And that's what I'm trying to do um, in a minute. But let's first um, re remind us of something else. The acceleration of this observer and this observer is not the same. We have seen that the acceleration, the strength of acceleration, which is really the thing you feel as you are accelerated, is inversely proportional to R. So this observer here feels twice the acceleration of this observer here, if he wants to keep that distance here the same. And that is maybe not completely intuitive, if you see it for the first time, but that's what I pointed out last time. If you start to move a stick, and now let me make sure actually the movement of the stick goes into the right direction of the diagram because there's this video image is somehow mirrored. So if the stick is first at rest, and now I move in this direction here, I accelerate in this direction, this would be really corresponding to a stick which could have one end here and one end here, which I start to accelerate which means now that the front, and there's a clear asymmetry between front and end. So the front, the thing that really looks into the direction in which you accelerate, has to accelerate harder than the tail. Uh, sorry, excuse me, that was the other way around. It's inverse proportional, of course, and, and, and here it diverges. So the front has to accelerate less. I'm sorry for that confusion. The front has to accelerate, of course, less then the tail. And if you have a long stick extending up to here, then you have here at some point an infinitely strong acceleration, which would mean the stick, if you really force it to, to, to be at the same length, would break somewhere close to here. Because whatever hard your material is, there is of course nothing that can accelerate infinitely strong. And that would just somehow break at that point. Okay, so this was mainly a reminder. And from now on, I, I would like to continue with um, new material, including this justification of what the green lines are, but it's maybe now a good time to ask questions if you have any. Doesn't seem to be the case that, that there are any. If there are any in the chat, then I'm sure I'm also notified about this. Can, can you yes. real quickly just draw the stick and the direction that it's moving in in relation to the Oh, yes. So if I have this diagram and this white, I hope it's visible. So let me. So this would be the stick, my pen here. If I now start moving like this, and I hope now the video is shown on your screen in the same way as yours, as in on my screen, then this would correspond to a diagram. So I move towards the right. And first at rest, that would be. Um, Actually, you could even think of it, of the stick actually coming in like this. It comes in. Now it's at rest for a little moment. I mean, an infinitely small moment, and then it starts accelerating into the past. That's just a constant acceleration towards um, that. Um, okay, towards this, this direction in which I point now. Does this answer your question? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Okay. I think last time I really showed it in the other direction. And this just had to do with the mirroring of the screen on my video. I have, I have another question. Yes, please. You simultaneity is uh, each one of those uh, green lines, right? That yes, part. that's what I now claimed, yes. So, uh, I mean, intuitively, I would think that uh, so simultaneously it's like all the ray lights that would get to a point Right, and all the events that are like all the rate lines that get to a point at a certain time, all the yes. events are seen as simultaneous. But the rate yes. the ray lights here at our 
they are at 45 degrees, right? Not at that. Yes. Uh, oh, okay. That's maybe one possible way in which I could justify the green line. So maybe let me try to give you an argument which follows your idea to use light rays. And then you will see that it actually matches the green lights. And then um, if it's not clear, please come back to me. So, okay, the, the construction that you have in mind is a bit, I mean, if you want to use um, light rays, let's first maybe do that um, for a coordinate system at rest, just to understand what we mean, what the experiment would be with the light rays. So let's suppose we are just, um, we have here the spatial axis and here the time axis, and it's again, flat space time. And let's suppose we have now a coordinate system for the moment in which you move just upwards. Um, so that would be the world line. Of course, I can always choose a coordinate system. Maybe just let me indicate it here on the right. So a coordinate system in which the, the direction upwards, which I call maybe T as before, let me put it like that. That would kind of be the time arrow that goes upwards. And um, the spatial component here is kind of orthogonal. So these are the normal coordinates. And I can always choose coordinates like that just to explain um, what the experiment would be. Now to determine, I mean, now you have just here space time. The question is, if you are at a certain, passing a certain event, let's say this one, what are the points of your space time you continuous as simultaneous? So how would you construct that? Now, as you said, we could use light rays, but the way you should use them is maybe as follows. You could say, let's, I mean, you have a clock and let's suppose the clock ticked here one second before the time you want to define simultaneous, simultaneity for, and here is another tick. So we could say this is maybe T equal minus one, and this is T equal zero, and this is T equal one. Now to define simultaneity, I would say, let's suppose you emitted a light ray into all directions at the point here when the, when the clock ticked minus one. So one second before the time you're interested in. So the light ray here goes, moves into this direction. And of course it could also go, you could also emit the light ray in the other spatial direction. So these are actually, I mean, the diagram is maybe misleading if you're not very used to space-time diagram. That just means you send, it doesn't mean you send two light rays into 45 degrees direction. It really means you, you have a, a laser beam and you send one, to, one light ray in, let's say, to the right and one to the left. So these are the blue lights. These are two light rays that you send up. Now you could say, Let's here draw also the light rays that would reach you at time t equal one. So these are the ones that go back with an angle of 45 degrees. So these should all be 45 degree lines. I'm not sure I'm, I'm perfect. Uh, I'm so good at drawing, but so let's suppose all the blue lines are 45 degree lines. Now you see there is this intersection, and if you would now think that there was an object here, so or an event, something happening here at the intersection and something here, then you would say these two events are really happening at the same time because the light beam going, let's say, into the left direction and coming back and the one into the right, or sorry, the left direction coming back and the one going the right direction coming back, came back at the same time, both moved at the speed of light. So the time when they hit the mirror, let's say, or the mirrors must have been the same time, namely t equals zero. So you would say, therefore, these purple dots are dots and co correspond to the same time. And of course, you could do it um, with half seconds, like um, emitting something here, and then it um, you would get a kind of diamond like this. And at the end, you would conclude that the green line that I'm drawing here is really the line of all points, of all events that are simultaneous. So now I've constructed an almost trivial thing, you would say, because I just said, oh, um, of course, this axis was just the thing orthogonal to the time axis. But it just looks trivial because we looked at it in the case 
where the coordinate system was aligned with our own movement. Let's now suppose that this observer still does exactly the same experiment, but we just represent the experiment now um, in another diagram. So actually now, I mean, in our diagram we had before, but let me briefly re redraw it. So remember that we had an um, observer moving like this. Now let's just look at one small interval of his movements. So let me maybe just focus here on, on, on this short segment of the world line, which should be so short that it's approximately straight. Of course, we can always go to a very short one. That's exactly what differential geometry does. So we have at some point the direction in this, in this thing. And this direction would, of course, if you go to the upper picture, correspond to the arrow I would draw here in the, on the upper thing. So it's just another, um, another representation. So in other words, what, what I mean is, let's suppose the movement in, in our um, overall global diagram is this. But if I now go to a local coordinate system, which in which the um, time direction is really the upwards direction, then of course everything looks like this. But now I can't go back and ask, how does this diagram look like here? Now, how does it look like? I just do the same experiment. And now I have to ask myself in this diagram, how do light ray moves? They still move at the 45 degree angle. That's by the way, um, yeah, I mean, it's just before, because it's still flat space time, it just rotated the coordinate system, but it's also visible from the metric. So light would move, okay, no, it's not, that was, so, um, yeah, light, move. maybe now I have the problem that I want to redo it infinitesimally. So let me briefly redraw it and say, we just look at the segment in which the curve is approximately straight, but no longer vertical. So that's now this arrow here. And now this person still does this experiment. He has ticks, for example, here one, here one before, and here one after. And now he sends out light beams and the light beams still move at 45 degrees. So that would be the movement of a light beam. Remember, space is flat. Now I'm just looking at it from the outside, but we know from any, um, in any um, coordinate system in which I have normal coordinates. So these would now be the normal coordinates for someone, um, let's say, who stays here. So think of an observer being here, and he just looks at what the other observer does. So that would be the experiment. You are here, let's suppose, and you just can describing what this person here does. So you have this 45 degree um, thing that any light also for you looks like 45 degrees independently of who sent it out. Then you have a line here like this. And then you have these backwards lines, which look maybe something like this. Okay, that was maybe not exactly 40. It's a bit hard to draw 45 degrees, or I should say I'm not very skilled at doing that. And here would be a backwards and that has 45 degrees. But I think you see the effect of that. The purple points are now those. So they're exactly the same point, just represented in a different diagram. So I can now still connect them. And you see there is now the green line being no longer horizontal, but slightly tilted. Actually, it turns out if you do it precisely that the tilt of this line, so the angle here, is actually the same angle as the angle you would draw here if you use normal coordinates. That's something you know from, if you did special relativity from there already. So in other words, we have now really used this an experiment, a basic experiment to fly to determine what simultaneity means. And we, we see that simultaneity in, in coordinates in which someone moves in this direction looks like this. Now, if you, if you think about what this means um, in terms of coordinates, then you will see that it really exactly corresponds to the W coordinates being constant. And um, that, I mean, there are different ways to see that. One way to see that 
is just to say that um, if you are in a small enough region, then the R is approximately constant. But if the R is approximately constant, then this looks again like a Minkowski metric. And in a Minkowski metric, we know that um, these are the, um, I mean, if this is a time type coordinate, this is the corresponding spatial coordinate. So if you only move R but leave W fixed, this should give you the spatial coordinates. So in other words, what this construction here told us is really the answer to that question. If I look at a particular point on this diagram here that I drew at the beginning, for example, this one, then this green line corresponds to what the observer at that point would at that moment consider to be simultaneous according to an experiment like this, which of course looks now from the outside like this. But for the observer, it just looks like this, if you would put the local coordinate system here. And the same, of course, here and everywhere. So the green, so this is essentially providing us the answer I asked at the beginning. The green, the green lines correspond to notions of simultaneity for an observer when he crosses the green line. There is not much point in saying what simultaneous from for this observer um, at but at an earlier time. So we always look at an observer, for example, the one here at that event and the ask what is simultaneous. And the answer is everything on the W, uh, on the omega equals V line. Okay, um, so I hope this, this answers the question. It also answers at the same time the question I asked at the beginning, although in a slightly different way than I intended, but I think this answer is equally valid. It's just a more geometrical or physical viewpoint to argue with these light rays. And I have a question. Yes, please. And this uh, um, yellow arrow you drew and mm -hmm. uh, the picture, is it um, in one tangent space so that uh, this middle, um, this middle tick is uh, our um, foot point for this tangent space, or it is yes. a segment from the word line? Yeah, that's a very good question. So, um, you know, I always now, because I'm in the physics part, cheat a little bit, but it's not really cheating, because you should um, at some point then see how it really translates to the exact mathematics. And what you said is precisely correct. So when I drew here such a direction vector, so I guess you meant one like this, then what it really means precisely is that you go to the actual tangent space at that point. So that's the idea. So we, we look at what happens here, in which direction does the curve move as I pass through this point. And you know that tan tangent vectors are even defined as the direction in which a curve goes. And now you just should always think it's an infinitesimal direction. So if the curve actually somehow bends, just think of a small enough um, region that you look at where it's approximately just going into a linear direction and that is what this picture should indicate. But the mathematic, mathematic or the mathematically precise statement is really that the direction of the curve exactly when it passes this point is given by a tangent vector and I somehow illustrate this tangent vector by this fat arrow here. And of course the tangent vectors now change. So if I'm now going back to this global diagram in which I'm no longer on a, on a small scale, I would say I have a tangent vector, for example, here when it passes the, omi the omega equals zero part. And then, for example, when it passes the omega equals three part, I have another tangent vector. These tangent vectors are not only different because they look as if they have different directions, they're really in different tangent spaces. So this one is a vector in the tangent space corresponding to the point here and that one here. But they always should be interpreted as the momentary direction of the world line. And so um, when you, for example, now think of this momentary direction of the world line, you could say at this point, the corresponding tangent vector telling you what simultaneity means. So this is the vector essentially pointing only in space and not in time is then the green vector. And here you would have a green vector like this at the origin. Does this answer your question? So in the in the um, 
in this metric that we're we're thinking about, not not the the uh, Minkowski. Uh, mm -hmm. So this point, the, the velocity of the observer at t equals z, uh, minus one zero and one, they are different, or they are the same. Um, the velocity, yeah. So they are. So I cannot anyway um, compare velocities at different points. So they are. So yes, they are different in the sense that they are even in different tangent spaces. So um, if if I'm passing here, I have a velocity, and if I'm passing here, and a priori I cannot even say there's even not a notion of whether it's the same. What I can say, however, is I can now use the affine connection and say if I take this velocity and pull it back to this one, I parallelly transport it back to that one. Is it then the same? And now, the, now it makes sense to ask the question, is it the same? And the answer would be no, because it's an accelerated one. If it was not an accelerated one, then the pullback of this thing to, to this tangent space at this point here would be the same. So in that sense, it's a, a changing vector because we have an accelerated observer. OK, thank you very much. You're welcome. OK, are there other questions? I think we are now really in a concept, or we are entering a conceptually more difficult part of the whole lecture. I mean, so far, it was, in a way, just mathematics. And in mathematics, in principle, you can always go back to the definition and identify very clearly where you have maybe a lack or missed something, maybe you missed a step in a proof. And now in the physics part, it's a little bit less well-defined. And this makes it more difficult, because we are somehow all the time relating mathematical things to physics. And that can sometimes not be, let's say, if you don't understand it, really be identified as one particular step, like in a proof. And so um, it's really, therefore, even more important now that you ask questions if anything is unclear. OK, but now I would like to conclude the discussion of the flat space time. And as I announced, actually move on to the curved space time. And um, for that, I just want to, you to notice one thing that I forgot to point out. If you now take these coordinates, which are, by the way, called the Rindler coordinates, so these are these omega r coordinates, these cover only a part of the Minkowski space time. So if you assume we have really flat space time, then of course there are events here in this wedge here. Clearly, but there is no Rindler coordinate corresponding to that point. I think I already said that. But there is a separation. So there is a maximum extent to which here, um, or a um, maximum region, which is covered by it. And this is called the Rindler wedge. So the Rindler wedge is essentially everything here in this part. That's, and you hear this term, Rindler wedge, that's this. Now, in terms of charts and, and so on, it just means that the chart domain of the Rindler coordinates is not the full manifold, which is perfectly OK. I mean, we always said charts only have to cover individual patches. But it's kind of interesting to note that despite the fact that these are very natural coordinates, which are physically motivated, they have a finite region. And what it really means is now, if you think physically, it means the following. And that is now something you will actually see again in the discussion of black holes. And you will probably, certainly on Thursday, understand why I'm saying that you, this is where black holes. Renata, yes? there, is a chat, there is a doubt in the chat. So mm -hmm. like, uh, the yellow area, do they correspond to three or four velocity or something else? Uh -huh. um, yeah, let's, so, um, I guess the yellow arrows, you, I mean, for me, they look orange, but maybe appear yellow somewhere. But yes, yeah, so the orange, so everything on, on now is in free space. And yes, that's a point. So they are in that sense for velocities, at least the, the orange ones or, or the ones that may appear as yellow. These are four velocities because they are vectors in, four, in the four dimensional space time and they correspond to and the direction of a world line of an observer. Yes, so that's absolutely correct. So actually, we are not going to talk 
any longer much about three velocity. This was just a concept we needed to somehow make the connection to our usual perception of how we see velocity. If you see a train passing by, then this is this relative notion of relative to you, there's this three velocity. A four velocity is defined without a reference. It's just this arrow. And this arrow is there even if there's no other object to compare it with. And once we know how to translate that into three velocity, for example, you could ask if you have an observer moving in this direction, what's the three velocity of this arrow here, of this four velocity with respect to that observer, then you would know how to calculate it. And because you know that, and because it's much more natural to talk about four velocity, I will from now on usually only talk about four velocity, otherwise, unless I mention otherwise. But thanks for the question. It's, it's important to keep that in mind. OK, so now the physical reason why we only see certain things here, or the, why this covers only a part, a part, is the following. Think of another particle or some particle passing here in a straight line. So this is at rest with respect to the x coordinate system. So not to the Rindler coordinate system. Now, suppose you are an observer here and you're somehow want, you want to talk about this orange, uh, this orange, this um, purple world line of the particle. Then you notice something strange, namely that if you ask yourself, when does this particle pass this line here, which I called kind of the horizon or, or the end of the Rindler wedge. So when in when does this event here happen? But when now in terms of, so to speak, your time, then this is really at time infinity. Because, okay, maybe um, to make that clearer, let me, maybe um, it, it may be useful, let me do that briefly before I start with the other thing, to, to make an approximation or to somehow introduce different coordinates and, and say why I always call these things W. So these coordinates will anyway be needed. So I'll somehow just rescale the coordinates. I say instead of omega, let's um, fix some F. And the F you should interpret as the acceleration you want to describe. So it's the acceleration of an observer who feels it. And then I would say the time that is natural for that observer is W over F. And the spatial coordinate for that observer is um, something called R minus one over F. So you see, this is really just the rescaling of the coordinates. Instead of W, F, instead of omega, this is not, a, I should always say omega. Instead of omega, we talk about T, but it's just rescaled by a factor in, instead of r of the distance from the origin we talk about the distance from a fixed point one over f so why do i do that i can then rewrite the metric of course when i say t is equal to omega over f this just means of course that um, dt is equal to one over f d omega I and mean, that's obvious and here it's even simpler, dx is equal to dr. So I can rewrite the metric in terms of these coordinates. And how does this look like? So remember the metric, I think I wrote it, or let me use it the right hand side. So you see the metric on the right hand side, there's an r square. But now if I replace t by d, dt by d omega, I get an additional factor of one of um, actually of f because I, I start with omega and write t, so I get an f square because it appears twice, dt dt minus, <clears throat> now just have dx dx because of this relation here. <coughs> and I just omit the other spatial terms, the one in the second and third direction. Uh, Renato, excuse me, there is one yes? doubt that what is f actually? Oh, yes. Uh, okay, I probably didn't explain f very well because I wanted maybe to explain. Let me write down the expression and then tell you what f is. So 
just take for the moment f as just a rescaling factor. Now, if I rewrite this, and I will just come back to the question, so I will not forget it. Um, if you see here r squared f squared, if I um, put in this, so if I replace r by x, then of course r is x plus one over f. And if I multiply it with f squared and square the whole thing, this can just be written as one plus fx squared dt, tensor dt minus dx, tensor dx. Now, the, the reason why I introduce these coordinates is the following. Suppose I have an Um, suppose I want to somehow determine um, how, um, yeah, let me, hmm. yeah, maybe I should do that later. Um, no, let, let me do that now. So remember, that we said last time that the acceleration that an observer has is one over R. So maybe I'll just write this here in a box. So last time we have derived the following. We have said that the strength of the ac acceleration is one over R. Now the idea is to say that let's suppose we want to model an observer who is subject to acceleration fixed to f. So I just said, I want to model some, I want to find the observer whose acceleration is exactly f. Then of course, I just need to, to choose r to be one over f. So I find, so if, um, let's say one over f is here, then I could put here a new observer, it should also be a world line, and this observer would have exactly acceleration f. So you should think of f as an acceleration. And now, um, I mean, you should think in the following way. Let's suppose you want to you have, for example, the Earth acceleration that you feel now, 9.81 meters per second per second. And now you want to put that into this diagram. Then I would say take f to be that acceleration. So f has now actually the units of one over second because meter and second cancel as we said c equal to one. So remember that we have the same units for time and space. Then an acceleration is one over a second. And that's at the same time. So the inverse of one over a second is again um, a length or um, can also be interpreted as a spatial length. So we find a place. So if F is now the Earth acceleration, we find some place in the diagram where we have an observer who has who exactly feels that the same acceleration that we feel now here. And now what we want to do is to have new coordinates which measure everything from start put making this here the zero point. So we essentially take this to be the new zero where we are and not that point here where we have the singularity, so to speak. So we take this as the zero. And that's what, what these coordinate transformations do. So I take a new x, which is just the distance of where I am. So if I move now a little bit, then I'm at a certain distance from this point where the acceleration is exactly f. And now I did this other rescaling. Why did I do this other rescaling? If you look at this new met the metric written in these coordinates, then as long as x is very small. So x is, you should now imagine r is somehow in this picture, the distance from us as we are standing here, for example, to let's say some remote point or um, the center of the earth. That's not exactly the case, but let's suppose it's some remote point. And the x now just measures the distance from, let's say, the ground to when I jump up by a meter or so. So in this case, this quantity is very close to one. 
which means that the time that passes really corresponds, I mean, the, the, you remember the time that passes given by the metric almost precisely corresponds to dt. So with this choice of coordinates, I have achieved that for an observer who feels acceleration f, the time coordinate t exactly corresponds actually to the time that he would see passing on his clock. And you see, it's just a rescaling of w. That's what we kind of already expected. So we said w is something like a time, but now this is made more precise. You can really interpret not only w being equal as points of simultaneity, but we can now interpret the value of w by saying if we divide the value of w by this f, then we get the time shown on that clock. So the summary of this is take f to be the earth acceleration, draw this green line, and then measure all distances from this point on. And then the t that I defined corresponds to the time passing for this observer. Now, um, just before the break, let me make this point that I wanted to make with this purple line. I'm sorry for this little detour, but I think it's now clear. So you can now think of the rescaled thing of W as the time, as I said. And you see, obviously, that there will be more and more green lines as I go up, because here we have already the line double, um, omega equal infinity. So the diagram probably looks like that. We have more and more, and they are denser and denser. And you have actually infinitely many. And each, top, each omega corresponds to a t, which means that the time when um, that is simultaneous. So the time when this observer here thinks that this purple dot is simultaneous to him lies at infinity. So for him, this never happens. So in, in the, for this observer who is constantly accelerated, it just never happens that this event occurs. There is never a time where he can say, now this occurred. Now meaning, meaning simultaneously to me seen being here. He will just make this line and never essentially cross this line of simultaneity corresponding to that point. And this is remarkable. It means that if you are constantly accelerated, which you are, as I pointed out, there are points in space time or events in space time which look as if they are perfectly valid points, but we would never say they happen simultaneously, even if we lived infinitely long. So even if you continue this line forever, you will never cross that line. And that's something to remember. I mean, that's some, some effect that we will see again just in the, after the break. OK, I think now it's just the right time to make a break. And then I can make a clean restart after the break with the um, Schwarzschild metric. And um, during the break, I'm, of course, happy to take any questions. So are there any? Um, I wonder what is this purple line? Is it a word line of something? Ah, yes. OK, thanks for asking. Yes, so that would be, so um, now this is a bit um, harder to imagine in our, ex so let me first um, describe it in the example where we forget at the moment that we are here accelerated on Earth because that somehow brings in already gravity. So let's suppose we are really in flat space time, but there is a spaceship which accelerates exactly with the Earth acceleration. And so this spaceship would be this thing here. So this is just a spaceship that starts somewhere and accelerates, accelerates more and more in, let's say, this direction. Let's suppose at the same time when the spaceship started, you just leave something there. So the, the station from which you started. This station is not accelerated, so this station just remains there. Now, um, in this particular example, the, this, this word line would just correspond to something that was left there when the spaceship started and is never accelerated. It's just a straight line or a geodesic of something. And by the way, this now means actually that if you are starting on a spaceship with constant acceleration, and let's suppose you 
you leave your friend here. I mean, we always have this Alice and Bob. Let's suppose you, you have your friend Alice here, but you are on the space. Okay, in this case, maybe it's, um, you are another person, B, I don't know your name, but let's suppose your first name is something with B. So you're accelerating here. Then what that would mean is that as you are accelerating, and let's suppose that's the birthday of, of your friend here. That's the, let's say, 80th birthday far in the future. Or then you would say, even if you lived here infinitely long, you would never be able to say now is the birthday of my friend Alice, who stayed as you are constantly accelerating. So you're essentially accelerating and um, um, as long as you're accelerating, you're described by this orange line, whereas a non-accelerated object is this straight line up. Now, if you look at the housing in the example of the Earth, where I said this acceleration doesn't come from a spaceship, but from Earth accelerating us upwards, then you should think of this line of something that is just in free fall. So let's suppose you, you drill a hole into the Earth, and then this is something that just falls into this hole and is not accelerated. Of course, at some point it will hit the center, and, and this diagram will not cover this, but um, at least for the moment it covers it, um, this would correspond to the straight line. It's just some freely falling object. But remember, I mean, maybe you have to come back to this Earth example in the context of the Schwarzschild metric, because there, of course, you have a finite lifetime until this thing will hit the center and so on, and then things are different. But the spaceship example, I think that works forever. So it really also corresponds to this idea that I mentioned last time, if you accelerate here and you have, um, that's now not the purple line, you have something like um, a light ray, it will never reach you. That has to do with the fact that here, after only a finite time passed, for you, an infinite time passed. So somehow the way you manage to escape the light beam is that you're just moving so fast that your time has somehow passed with respect to that one, to the one here, before anything happened to you in this diagram. Well, there are many stories one can now tell, but um, I probably gave now too long answer. The short answer is just the purple line is a non-accelerated object, free falling object. Does this clarify? Yes, yes, very nice, thank you. You're welcome. There is one doubt in chat. Can I read it? Yes. Okay. What's the point now? Yes. Now I was just answering essentially a question about what is the um, purple line. So the um, the question is what? Which point do we ultimately want to illuminate? So I think. Um, Maybe I, I gave a too long answer. So I, I really just wanted to probably say, this is a freely falling object, but then mix into this answer some other aspect. And, and this other aspect that is important to me is essentially the aspect that um, if you consider here different observers, so you, you think you have an observer here on this line and one on this line, then um, if you put into the picture also the time that passes for the observers, then it becomes kind of interesting in, in different ways. So you, you see things that you maybe find are a bit unexpected. And actually, yes. Actually, he doesn't mean that thing. Could you, re I actually, sorry, I actually didn't get it what he meant by. About the current section of the lecture. Yes. Okay, yes. So um, the current section of the lecture was just um, about Rindler coordinates. And the reason we are discussing Rindler coordinates will probably become clear in the next hour, because what we will show right now after the break is that um, if we take the Schwarzschild metric, which we will introduce and look at it locally, we just go to a particular point, which is, and, and the region, which is small enough so that curvature doesn't play a role and look at the whole thing in 
Rindler coordinates, then this is a very natural thing to look at things. So more precisely, we will see that if we go, if we take the Schwarzschild metric and go actually to the place where it looks as if it has a singularity, which you will see exists. So there will be something called the Schwarzschild radius at which it looks as if this metric has a singularity. If we go there and introduce different coordinates, then we will see that they, they approximately up to second order terms look like the Rindler coordinates, which in turn will mean, and I will explain all that, that we can think of it again as flat space time locally, just in different coordinates. So we will essentially retrieve an expression that looks like the Rindler coordinates. And for that, to understand what that then means, it was important that we are now familiar with the Rindler coordinates. So that's the purpose of what we were doing. I hope that answers the question. I'm not sure um, whether the question was referring to that. Okay, good. So it seems to have answered the question. Um, yes, it's still the break, but maybe I can use that to say a few um, general admin things which are unrelated to the material. Um, so first, uh, an administrative note about the tutorials. Um, Adrian Poitier, who offers one of the tutorials, had the idea to ask you usually every week for a topic he would focus on in his tutorial session. And the idea is that you can vote on the topic and you will find the, some choices, some possible topics on the Moodle page. So please, if you want to vote, go there and um, cast your vote. I think there, there's probably a deadline, so um, because you need some time to prepare it. So it's only a good idea if you do that still today. Then the other admin thing is um, some people notify me of the fact that the system that we are using to record um, the lectures is not so optimal on certain devices. It doesn't work well, apparently. In, if, for example, I guess some people want to watch it more slowly or, or, or faster or whatever. And they said that YouTube has more functionalities. So I guess this concerns no one who is here now live because I guess you're those who are listening to it, not on the recordings, but those who now will watch the recordings, that's for them. So I will maybe test that once and put it once on YouTube if no one minds. I don't think this will change anything in terms of privacy because the links were kind of um, accessible to everyone and then see how this goes. And if this goes well, and if you give me feedback that I should keep that, I will just in the future put them on YouTube. For me, it doesn't matter. Everything is fine. I just usually need some time a few hours because for some reason when I end the Zoom session the, my computer requires quite some time to do the rendering until I have a file that I can upload. Okay so these were my um, admin comments. Maybe one last comment um, in that direction. You have probably noticed that in the lectures last week and also um, today we have no longer followed the lecture notes. This is really the part now where I'm about to deviate a lot from the lecture notes. The parts in the lecture notes are somehow still there. So I'm just changing the order. And the reason why I changed the order will become clear. I will just explain it in a minute. Um, but don't worry, we are adapting the lecture notes as well. So um, at the very end of the semester, we will have certainly have complete lecture notes covering everything. Maybe the order will not exactly match those of the lectures, but it will at least be clear what you can find where. And um, however, we, we require some time to do that. So it's not always the case that the lecture notes will be available exactly at the time where I will cover the material. In fact, it will often be the opposite because some of the teaching assistants will help me doing that by listening to the lecture and adapting the notes. 
Now, actually, the reason why I changed the order, and let me now continue. So, welcome everyone back from the break. Um, uh, actually, Renato, there was one more question. What happens yeah. if an observer accelerates towards minus x? Um, uh -huh. Well, yes. Okay, so the, let me first answer that question. Well, thanks for the question. So, the question is what if if the acceleration is in the opposite direction. So actually I just chose the diagram in the direction in which you have the acceleration. If you have an acceleration in the opposite direction, I will um, it um, will just look mirrored. So I guess um, you can imagine, I will not draw it, but it's just essentially you flip the diagram over. So take this piece of paper and look at it in the mirror. Um, of course, the diagram always, I mean, keep in mind that the diagram refers to or is kind of motivated by this experiment where I move a stick. So everything should move in the same direction. If I have pieces accelerated in one direction and others in others, then I better draw different diagrams with different coordinate systems. So the coordinate system, the Rindel coordinates are always adapted to one particular, let's say, if you want, solid stick moving in one direction and um, and yes if you have different sticks then choose different coordinates i hope this answers the question okay now um the reason for the change of the order of of the topics is the following we have mentioned or we have seen already that there is a central equation the einstein field equation which i actually mentioned to you several times when we actually when we introduced the topics that, or the, the notions that were required to formulate it and the one in vacuum was already introduced quite early it can be phrased as saying that the ricci tensor is equal to zero now Probably you also remember that the Ricci tensor is itself, of course, a derived object from the metric. So ultimately, you should understand this equation as an equation for the metric. So more precisely, this R is written in terms of the gamma symbols and derivatives of the gamma symbols. And the gamma symbols in the Levi-Civita connection, which is the one that is relevant in GR, are themselves derivatives of the metric. So this is an object involving first and second derivatives of the metric being equal to zero. Now you may compare this, I think, to, for example, let's say electrodynamics. So we have, um, let me put that in blue. So in, in electrodynamics, we would have field equations. And I will now not or, okay, maybe I write them down in a short form. Those who have seen it in the relativistic context have seen that in electrodynamics, we can write them like this. But don't worry about that. At the end, we found solutions. And these, I mean, okay, maybe it's still to make sure I don't lose anyone. So we have, for example, things like this, um, the divergence of the electromagnetic field is equal to zero. And for example, that the rotation of the, of the magnetic field is zero and so on. These would be the electrodynamic equations in vacuum. Now, the point I want to make is that even if you are looking at electrodynamics in vacuum, you still have interesting solutions. Of course, one solution is just that the E field and the B field are just both equal to zero. But that's one, just one solution. But depending on the boundary conditions, you have also other solutions. So the solutions include, for example, waves. So something of this form that the E field is um, something like E0 times, for example, sine um, Kx. I mean, I'll not go into the details now. Or you could even say that if you have a spherically symmetric charge distribution, but you, if you look at stuff outside of the charge, then you have a solution that may look like this r. So r is now just the vector from the center to where you are divided by r to the three. So that's the 
electromagnetic field coming from a charge. Now, if I say R is positive, so that's a central charge at, at position zero, but for R equal, for R strictly positive, I'm outside of the charged region. So I'm essentially talking about a region that is completely free of charge, it's vacuum. So in that sense, this thing one could call a vacuum solution. Of course, you would say it's, the origin is, is the charge at the center, but at the end, and it's a solution, it's a, a field assignment, it's an assignment of the electromagnetic field in a region, or strictly positive, where there is never a charge and where the relevant equation is that one for electric field. And what we are now going to do in GR is the same for the Einstein field equation. So before we even talk about matter, we can already talk about interesting solutions. And in a way we can talk about wave equations. These will be the gravitational waves. So gravitational waves can be studied just from this equation, unless we, want, we are interested in the source of the gravitational um, waves. But if you just want to study the propagation of gravitational waves, this is all contained in this equation here. Of course, this equation looks simpler than it is because, you know, this is a complicated object, but it's really just that equation you have to solve. And the same is true if we look at analogously to, to the charge, the, mag the gravitational field, if you like, outside of a spherically symmetric body. So, for example, if you look at what is the gravitational field outside of the Earth, not in the Earth. In the Earth, there is matter all around, and, and it's no longer a vacuum solution or in the sun, but outside of the sun or outside of the Earth, there is vacuum, a good approximation, and these solutions satisfy this equation here. And now, before we even actually start deriving the solutions, we can already talk about the solutions and investigate its properties. And the same you could have done in electrodynamics. I'm just giving you that as an analogy because I assume you're already familiar with electrodynamics and then you can kind of understand where we are. So of course I can, for example, discuss that solution of the Maxwell equations without deriving it. And then ask, we could ask ourselves, how does, for example, a charge that is um, in this electromagnetic field behave? How does it move? within such a wave solution? Or how does a charge move in this field? Of course, the answer is quite simple. It will just be essentially if it's positive repelled from the center, but we can study that even before I tell you how you are, why this is the solution of this equation. And I choose to do the same now for gravity. So before I tell you why something is a solution, which we can do, that's like a separate task. I give you a solution, I just claim it and then we spent some time investigating, investigating how, now not charges, but how to test particles, little masses move within that solution. And in the context of GR, I think this is from a pedagogical viewpoint, not unreasonable to do. Usually you don't do that in electromagnetism, you usually first solve the Maxwell equations, but actually it's maybe also not true. Usually you first learn about um, the central symmetric charge and so on. But in particular in GR, I think we need to familiarize ourselves with solutions, what they mean before we derive them. And then also the motivation to derive them is probably much clearer. Um, there is a request that, uh, can you scroll up on yes, the right? Yes, I can, yes. Okay, so let me therefore just state one solution. This is the Schwarzschild solution. And currently it's, I mean, this is the current numbering of the script of the lecture notes. And as I said, I will probably rearrange them a bit. It's the Schwarzschild metric. So the first thing I should again point out is, okay, that I think I'm now at the wrong place. In the, somewhere, okay. I think I, okay, here. Somehow moved into another document. But let me do that now here. So this, let me first make you aware of the fact that when I talk about solutions of this, as I said, this is a derived object from the metric. So the solution is really a statement about the metric. So in the same way, I could here 
of course, give the electrodynamic equation in terms of the electrodynamic potential, for example, which is somehow related to the electromagnetic field E. So just regard this as something involving G, a metric. And now I tell you one solution of that is the following. And I hope you have already seen it in the exercises and, and made the first encounter with it. It's two G, where G is the gravitational constant, M, where M is for the moment just another constant with the dimension of a mass. And of course, it will correspond to the mass that somehow you could imagine generates this solution, but we are only looking at the solution outside of the mass. It's a vacuum solution in its sense. So that's the first term. The second term is almost the same, except for an important inversion, dr, dr. And then now let me here write now the other dimensions, which I give in spherical coordinates. It's d theta, d theta. So think of theta as um, the polar angle, and then maybe phi as the azimuthal angle. So I have here the usual thing that you know from um, from the sphere. So I could also just abbreviate that and call it G omega, which is just essentially the surface of the sphere. So this part is the same as for the surface of the sphere, scaled with the radius of the sphere, so to speak. So this really looks like the usual metric. And there's nothing special here. What is special is in the R coordinate, we have this prefactor. And in the time coordinate, we have this prefactor here. And a lot. Um, of this, um, of, of the next statements of the next lectures um, is about understanding exactly that metric. So we'll devote quite some time um, reading what it tells us, essentially. So um, I will not write everything, but one range I should give is the range of R. R cannot be arbitrary, as you can probably see. If R is equal to 2GN, then this, ter this term here is zero, which, okay, that's not such a problem. No, it's actually a problem. So if this term here becomes zero, then it may look as if the metric is no longer non-degenerate. So remember, a metric has to be um, non-degenerate. So it should not have zero entry. So this already looks strange, but here it's even worse. Here you have one over a zero value, which diverges. So definitely it would be a bad idea to, to put in for R2 GN. So we simply don't do it, just omit it. But R can be everything else, essentially from zero to infinity. And then theta, I'll not write it down, is the usual polar angle between zero and, and pi and phi between zero and two pi. Now, this is not only the Schwarzschild metric, this is the Schwarzschild metric in Schwarzschild coordinates. So these are two things. So a metric can be defined as a coordinate independent thing. But of course, to write it down, I also need coordinates. And so this inventor was lucky, he was now kind of given, um, or his name is now um, essentially um, will remain for us eternally, first of all, because he defined the metric, but also because he essentially used coordinates to, to specify it. But we will, this is important because later we'll still look at the Schwarzschild metric, but in terms of other coordinates. So for example, we'll um, maybe next Tuesday, and uh, you have seen that all in the, in the exercises, probably, sorry, next Thursday, and um, we will, for example, give the Schwarzschild metric in terms of kruskal sequeres coordinates, which means it's the same metric, but a different chart to represent it. So please keep that distinction in mind. Now, the reason why I made this analogy of electrodynamics is in a way, this is really the solution corresponding to this thing here. So in electrodynamics, you have this central symmetric solution. And it turns out that 
if you require, so if you take the Einstein equations, the field equations, and ask yourself, what are what is what are all solutions? What's the family of all solutions that are symmet rotationally symmetric or spherically symmetric? Then um, you will essentially find that all these solutions are captured by this metric here for different values of m. So it's really, the, in a way, the most general solution that is spherically symmetric. And of course, if we have things like planets creating a gravitational field, and if you assume that they are approximately spherically symmetric, then we would expect also the solution to be spherically symmetric. That's actually not a, uh, really an implication. I mean, that's in general not true, but at least one solution is like that. So why is it not true? It's not true because let's suppose we have, first of all, this spherically symmetric solution, let's say, of the Earth. So it would be the metric describing things here above um, the surface of the Earth, not within the Earth, as I pointed out. Um, but then if, let's say, a gravitational wave comes about from, from a distant object, then it will be superposed onto that solution. So we will have essentially this basic solution, the Schwarzschild solution, which is which is spherically symmetric. But then there is a, a this spherical symmetry is broken by an additional boundary condition, namely that there is this, that there is this <coughs> um, gravitational wave coming. There is another um, potential problem with the metric. We already excluded the point where this becomes zero. But notice that if we put in a value smaller than, strictly smaller than 2gm. <clears throat> then this term here becomes negative. Which is strange, um, but at the same time, this term here becomes positive because it had a minus sign before, but then the bracket is negative. So th this term becomes positive, which actually means that what we call the R coordinate is now a time like coordinate, and what we call the T coordinate is a space like coordinate. Of course, the coordinate doesn't care how it is called. So, the important thing what it is. And the, the statement I'm making here is that um, what we call the T coordinate is not in the whole domain of this chart here, a time like coordinate. So that's the first thing you should notice. So essentially there's a swapping of roles exactly at the point 2gm, which is the point where the metric is not even defined. So it really looks like as if this region where R is 2gm <coughs> is a very nasty region. It's not only that everything diverges, even the space and time coordinates change their roles. Now, I, I don't want to um, maybe make that too dramatic and immediately tell you what it actually means. What it means is merely that the choice of coordinates is a bad choice to describe this region close um, to R being 2GM. But there's actually um, nothing bad happening in this region. So, the idea is that we will later be able to introduce new coordinates where, and in these new coordinates, the Schwarzschild metric, the same metric will in this region, which looks highly problematic here, just look perfectly nice and smooth and almost flat. So that's the first thing that we will discover. I mean, the first thing we will, first of all, do a few other things, <clears throat> but that's, that will be an important discovery. And that's a non-trivial thing, but it has to do with um, concepts that we introduced at the very beginning. Remember that I always had these diagrams where on the left-hand side, we had the real manifold, the, the space-time, and on the right-hand side, we had the chart and all the chart representations. This is clearly something that is chart-dependent. So if something diverges here, that by no means implies that in the real world, in the real space-time, things are diverging. It may just be an artifact of our choice of charts. And that's indeed what is the case at the point r equal to gm. However, 
there's another point where things diverge, namely the point where little r is zero. And there, there's a real divergence. There you will not find any chart um, where things look smooth. So why do I know that? I mean, how can I make these statements? Of course, one needs to do some calculations, but to make the statement, one thing you can do is you can just calculate the curvature. And if you calculate the curvature at the point two r, little r equal to two g n, so this point which looks dangerous because this becomes zero, then you will find that the curvature is actually not diverging at all. It's, it's just almost equally large as in the, in the neighborhood. Whereas if you calculate the curvature for r equals zero or approaching zero, then you will see that it diverges. And now remember the curvature is a real thing. So when I say it diverges, I mean that even coordinate independent things diverge. So um, it's not now a coordinate artifact, it's really the, the actual curvature, which has a geometric meaning, remember, that diverges. So in this sense, there's really a difference between these two types of singularities. Okay, so that's one remark I wanted to make. Um, now the other remark is um, to tell you that, I mean, now I talked about this region where R is equal to 2GM. Uh, there is a question, sorry. Yes. Uh, so from the interior space, can I explode the singular point to obtain a smooth pseudo Riemannian manifold? Um, yeah, that's a, um, a good idea to, to just remove a point where it doesn't work. And yes, in this case, um, we would be able to do that. We can just remove the point. However, it's not actually just a point. It's of course, I mean, I shouldn't have said point. It's of course the whole space where R is equal to that value, which is a whole sphere in a sense. So I would remove the whole sphere. And then what remains is a smooth manifold, but actually two disconnected parts in a way. But that can be done. But then what we will find is that the things I removed can be kind of smoothly completed and put together. So they just look as if they were separate, because in principle, if I have two coordinates, which, or if I remove something somewhere in a manifold and now I have two manifolds, it's not clear that if I never saw, saw the entire one, whether I can put the pieces nicely together. But in this particular case, this, as we will show by, by going to another coordinate system is the case. So we, we can fit the two things together. So we, it's, it's a removal in the same sense as if you, for example, take angular, um, uh, take angles in, in the polar coordinates, and then you say, okay, the angle has to go from zero to two pi, but should you now ex include two pi or not? Then the answer is no, you, you cannot, because then it's no longer unique. So you have to remove essentially um, one line. And, um, but of course, you can now put two um, charts and, and, and complete the whole thing. So there was like, the second part also he has mm -hmm. that the resulting manifold. So the resulting manifold is not simply connected anymore. Um, yes, it's not. But yes, that's um, yes, it's not a priori. But as I said, you can then again connect it. Of course, by connecting it, you you change it. You you put in the missing part. It's like as if you cut something and then it's disconnected and then you remo remove the cut again. And the point is we can remove the cut again. So we essentially introduce exactly the missing piece and we can make it again one connected manifold. Now there are several things we need to do to understand this metric. So now we're just at the start. One thing we can do first to just get some ideas of what it tells us is to ask ourselves, how does it behave if R is very large? So first of all, what does R even mean? So it's actually hard to understand what R means if you look at this term here, because there's this strange prefactor. However, if you look at this term here, then the R has a very clear meaning. It's actually, um, I mean, if you would integrate in a way over this thing, you would see, you would just get um, from this here, that's just the area element of of a sphere. So if you integrate over that, you would get essentially four pi and then times r squared. 
So, or you could even integrate just going around this thing. So this term really tells you that R has the meaning of being, of corresponding to the surface when you are somewhere. So if you're, for example, um, um, let's say on the surface of the earth and you treat and you ask yourself, what is R? Then you have in principle two choices. You could say R really corresponds to the distance. That's how you would usually probably think to the distance of the surface from the center. But there's also another possibility. You could say, no, R is essentially a measure of how long is the path if I walk once around the earth or R is a measure for the surface of the earth. You could say R is defined by saying that R squared times four pi is the surface or almost equivalently in this case, you could say R is defined by um, the circumference divided by two pi. And in this particular metric, it really makes a difference how you think. This term corresponds to the second way of thinking to, to go walk around the earth, whereas this term would be connected to really move in radial direction. But here this doesn't work nicely because clearly R doesn't correspond to the distance you actually move because there's this prefactor. So in other words, in this metric, you should interpret R not as a distance from the center. It's still true that if you move away from the distance, if you increase it, then R will grow. I mean, but there's a prefactor here. So it's, it's not um, a direct measure of the distance. Whereas this thing here is, is much more reliable. So if, if you are somewhere in this space time with this geometry and you ask yourself, what does this R mean? Then it really means that if you walk around this center, so it's very symmetric, there's a kind of a center defined, then um, this is the circumference corresponding to that radius. So that's how you should think of R. So once you now think in this way of R, you can now ask, what if R is very large? So if you intuitively are on a very big surface, which you would of course think is one that is very far away from the center. So in this case, indeed, all these terms here tend to one because now R is going to infinity. So this whole term here can be neglected here as well. And then it's indeed true that walking R away from the center now corresponds to the distance you walk away from the center. So in the limit where R is very large, this connection between what it means to move radially and what it moves to move around the center, um, again, coincide in that sense. And even more, I mean, in this case, also the time has no prefactor. So everything behaves as essentially in flat space because if the prefactor here is one and here the prefactor is minus one, then we are just in Minkowski space expressed in um, spherical coordinates. So that's the first thing I want to know. So this metric G for very large R asymptotically approaches Minkowski space. Well, that's already good to know. That's kind of, um, I think we would, for example, expect to be true for planets that if you move very far away from a planet, then we are again in just Minkowski space. It doesn't matter that there was a planet in the center. And that's indeed the case here. Now, the second thing is, um, and, and that I hope you have here done some preparation, the exercises, but don't worry if you haven't, I will just make a very basic calculation. Remember that the geodesic equation um, for, is particularly simple if you start just in one direction. So let's suppose I, I, go, I walk into a pure time direction. So I just ask myself, how do I move as um, if I start? So I have, have a test particle which starts being at rest. And being at rest means it only moves in the time direction. So this really, I mean, at rest now means with respect to this coordinate system, to the Schwarzschild coordinates. So I take something at the fixed radius from this center or at a fixed position R, which is in that sense at rest. And now the geodesic equation, let me write it down. In general, of course, um, looks like this in coordinates. And now write it down in coordinates. And now I will use this usual convention that 
instead of numbering the coordinates, I will use the coordinate names. I have done that last time. So um, if I'm um, if I start with d to the dt, then these things here at the starting point at least have only a component in the t direction. So the geodesic equation simplifies a lot. The geodesic equation is now just let me put that on the left hand side. I t t. So this just comes from the fact that gamma dot t, so that's a zero component, the t component is equal to one and all others gamma dot i for i not equal to the t component is equal to zero. So we have only that um, part of the, or these components to consider um, for in this particular case. So let me briefly calculate this gamma symbol. So you probably know that, remember that the gamma symbol is given by in the Levi-Civita connection. And it looks in this particular case like this. So n is now still an index over which I sum and i is an arbitrary index, but t is the zero component. So this may be confusing if you see it for the first time, but I explained this last time that we can always use these variable names, but if if this disturbs, you just replace t by a zero. Minus g t t n. I think this was the general expression we had for the Levi-Civita connection when in the particular case where these two indices are the time indices. So I can now evaluate that for i being also the t component. But if i is the t component, then you see I get only a contribution here where and because g is diagonal, I only have here a t, t a contribution. And then the bracket here, they're always t's. So I have just this, um, this that um, is left if I sum and subtract all those. So this means I take the time-wise derivative of the t, t component. So the t, t component is this, but it has no time dependence. And since it has no time dependence, the time derivative of it will just be zero. So this gamma symbol just disappears. If I now take the gamma symbol in the R direction, um, then I have to do again the same calculation, but this time there is this GRR. And then from um, this part here, okay, let's see, there is N is now R. So I have RT comma T, and here again, RT comma T, but R comma T is an off diagonal term. But if you look at the metric here, there are simply no off diagonal terms. So these two disappear anyway. So I only get this one, which has a minus sign. So let me put the minus here in front. And then it's G T T comma R. And this I can evaluate. So first of all, I have again this um, minus one half and then what's GRR? GRR is of course this prefactor but it's the inverse because remember if if for the G if for the metric tensor the components upstairs mean the inverse metric but the inverse of a diagonal metric can be easily calculated by just taking the inverses of the diagonals. So this inverse of the diagonal is just one minus 2m over r and there's also a minus sign here so I can just keep track of that by erasing that minus sign I had at the beginning and then I still need to take care of the um, position derivative the r derivative of gtt so gtt is this first component if I take the derivative with respect to r I get 2gm over r squared so let me write this down. 2gm over r squared. And okay, now I'll, I mean, that's essentially the result. That's this gamma symbol. But let me now make an approximation for um, the purpose of, of um, explaining what this is. So let's still assume that r is very large. 
If R is very large, I have, of course, um, the lowest order term is this one with a one here. And, and the term where I multiply this with this gives already a contribution of R to the three, which we may neglect. So if I only keep the, the quadratic terms in R, then I get M over R squared. Now, why did I do this derivation? Let me put it into our geodesic equation, which was simplified like this. So we now have the right hand side. What we found is that, so that's our conclusion, and that will be an interesting conclusion. We found that gamma dot dot r, so the change of the r coordinate is given by minus m over r squared plus higher order terms, which I um, kind of ignore here for the moment. Now, what does this here mean? This means that the acceleration in the r direction, so the dot dot means, of course, the acceleration in this component. And remember, we discussed the acceleration quite a lot. And um, I have a question. Yes. Where um, did the g go? Yes. The g. Ah, the g. Where did g did go? Ah, sorry. What? Ah, yes. That's a good point. That's a something I forgot um, to put. Thanks for reminding me of that. I actually first wanted to set g equal to one when I made my notes, but then at some point I decided to include it. So that's why it wasn't there, but you're perfectly right. The g has to be there. And that was actually the, exactly this equation was even the reason why I wanted to keep it. So thanks for reminding me of that. So now that what this equation tells us is that acceleration is given in the R component. And there is of course only the R component by spherical symmetry is given by this expression g m over r squared. And that's of course exactly what you would expect in Newton gravity for the acceleration on a test particle coming from a big mass, for example, a planet of mass m. So this big capital G is of course the Newton gravitational constant. So what we found is that if you are very far away from the center, so that we can neglect higher order terms. But indeed, I mean, that's not a precise result. That's only an approximation. But in this approximation where we can neglect these terms, we find the expression for Newton gravity. And this justifies in retrospect why I call this M. So of course, I never put in the mass. I just said, this is a family of solutions, of spherically symmetric solutions with some parameter M. But now we can, in retrospect, justify it and say that such a solution corresponds exactly to the one where, in Newton gravity, I would have had a mass m. And we will, also, of course, also see later when we solve for these solutions that this mass has, has still the significance in Einstein gravity. But for the moment, we essentially, by analogy to Newton gravity, found that the m parameter, so this thing that entered here just as a parameter can be interpreted as the mass of the source that generates the gravitational field, so to speak. Okay, so we have found the second thing. So the first thing was that far away from the center, it's like Minkowski space. Now the second thing we found is that it behaves, if, if we take into account geodesic equations, then far away from the center, it behaves as in Newtonian gravity. So the R change, the, the way it will change um, the distance from the center, so to speak, which far away has a meaning, has the usual meaning, is exactly as you would expect in Newtonian gravity. And OK, I think that's um, essentially what I wanted to discuss today. And on Thursday, we will enter into the more interesting region. And for today, I just would like to give you an overview of what will um, follow in the next few lectures. So we have already, or I've already pointed out that there is this region in which there is a problem. Now, where is this region in reality? So apparently, far away, it's like Newtonian gravity. But if we come close, then clearly non-Newtonian things happen. Time gets distorted in a way you can see. I mean, um, that, of course, wouldn't be there, that term in Newtonian gravity. But also length somehow gets a different meaning. So moving radially has no longer the usual meaning um, if you compare it to moving 
um, tangentially to the sphere. Now, it will even not just a little bit deviate, it will deviate maximally because these terms really get infinity and zero and so on. So one could say that very close to the place where, where this is one, we have a complete departure from Newtonian gravity. And this of course raises the question, where does this happen? So if you, for example, take the earth, the mass of the earth, where does this <clears throat> happen? So where is this, um, this critical distance. Now, if you want to think about it, you should first of all keep in mind that we solved the vacuum solution. So the solution would be valid in particular if you would shrink the earth onto a very small point so that you can really move very close to that mass. So think of the whole earth mass as being put into a tiny point, so to speak. Now, it, in this case, we can now move very close to the center, so to speak, without leaving the vacuum solution. Of course, in real Earth, if you drill a hole, what happens if you go into the Earth is that the gravitational um, acceleration will decrease. And if you're in the center, it will, of course, by symmetry, be zero. But now think of, of just um, instead of drilling the hole, you take all the mass and, and focus it in the center. Then you can go very close. And it turns out, in this case, this is the valid solution. And the relevant R where, where you get this um, disastrous behavior will be essentially um, of the order of, I think, a, a few centimeters. So if you had all the mass um, concentrated and you, you would approach it by um, up to a centimeter or so, then you would get this behavior. For the sun, it's of the order of kilometers, um, but you will have the same. So if you put all the sun mass into one point, then and approach it to one kilometer, you will um, see that behavior. And that behavior, probably not surprisingly to you, is exactly the behavior that we then call the Schwarzschild radius. So this radius, this critical radius, 2GM is the Schwarzschild radius, which corresponds to the radius of a black hole. So put it differently, if you would indeed put all the mass of the Earth on such a small scale, then if once you would put the mass into a region smaller than 2GM, so smaller than a centimeter or so, you would find, um, you, you would have converted it into a black hole. So a black hole is essentially defined by an object in, in this sense, in this metric where all the mass is inside of this critical radius 2gm so that you have the full power of the divergence here getting um hitting you now I, I just told you before that this is not really a nasty region that nothing special happens here it's just a, a coordinate artifact so how do, why do i now say that there's really um something like I, I was now still talking about it as if there's something special happening so the answer to that question is the following. So let's maybe think of a larger black hole. So if you have, of course, more massive objects like the black hole that was pictured relatively recently, these have, for them, this, this quantity is enormously big. I, I, to be honest, I'll have to look it up what it is. I will do it for next time. But it's certainly not only of the order of kilometers, but it's, it's something where um, um, the time light needs to pass it is substantial, it's minutes, maybe even um, hours potentially for certain black holes. But if you're now, um, so the statement we will try to understand next time is that if you would now be an observer who falls, who approaches that black hole, if you pass this region, this Schwarzschild um, radius, you would notice essentially nothing, nothing special would happen to you. However, from an outside observer, and of course coordinates reflect the viewpoint of observers, there is still something special happening at that point. And what you will see, and this will now go back to that, is that for an outside observer, this Schwarzschild radius will look exactly like this diagonal line here. That's maybe now surprising, and, and I'm sure, I mean, probably you cannot yet understand it, but that will be the, on Thursday the goal. We will 
actually make the point that from an outside observer, this, this region of R being equal to 2GM is essentially equivalent to that diagonal line. It's, it's in a sense, therefore, not a space. It's actually, it's not a spatial region. So you would think, oh, this Schwarzschild radius is if I'm very close to the black hole. But you see here, this is not the space. Spatial region would be something like, um, I mean, it would move in and, and like a spatial object would have this shape here. That's, that is the spatial object. This is kind of a time, a, a light-like object. So the black um, hole horizon or the Schwarzschild horizon is essentially a light-like thing. And in the same way, as I told you here, that you can escape it, you can escape, of course, falling into a black hole by constantly um, accelerating. So to make that precise and to, to present it in a way that you can really understand it um, is the goal of the Thursday lecture. So far, I just wanted to give you essentially this outlook so that um, you are aware that it may be worth to study this again, just in view of what's coming and, and to be well prepared to what I'm going to tell you on Thursday. Okay, that was all for today. I wish you a nice day and hope to see you again on Thursday.